1952, a country boy from Kent was uprooted and placed in a city. A dirty, smoky city, surrounded by monstrous smoking mountains that at night glowed red with fire like so many volcanoes. A city governed and ruled by coal, coal from pits going to pots and ironworks. A city so polluted with smoke that on a clear summer's day, driving from Litchfield to Rugeley, coming across the ridge, you could see where Stoke was. Not by sight, but by the black cloud that hung in an otherwise clear sky, over where it lay. Now, 50 years later, standing on Parker Wills with my granddaughter, she said, Grandpa, why do you call it smoke on Trent? There's no smoke anywhere. Where did they go, all them pits? North Staffordshire, the Potteries, a sprawling mass of towns and villages right in the heart of England, rich in industrial heritage and world famous for its pottery and creative design. But it was the coal beneath our feet that fired the famous pottery kilns. It provided fuel for the furnaces at Shelton Bar and work for thousands of men across North Staffordshire. But then it stopped. 700 years of coal mining in North Staffordshire came to an end. But what happened to all those collieries? And more importantly, what happened to all those men? Memorials are scattered across the area to remember their work and their lives, and there are plenty of people keen to celebrate the history of this great industry. We've got records, so we know there was coal mining in North Staffordshire in the early 14th century. I think 1316 at Norton in the Moors, and the monks at Abbey Hulton were mining on their estate in the 14th century. Uh, but investigations into Roman uh, remains in the area. There's a pottery kiln found at Holditch, 2nd century, seems to have been coal-fired. So it looks as though certainly we're getting on for 2,000 years. It's probably older than that. It evolved. It just didn't sort of happen by somebody digging down a shaft. It was, <clears throat> there was lots of um, coal lying about virtually near to the surface. So you got these um, uh, open casts, if you like. Then you've got the drifts mines where people just simply cut a hole in the side of a hill and walked in and got the coal. And then you started to go deeper for the better coal and you had bell pits where you know, these, these um, shafts were cut down. But you imagine these things, I mean sometimes they go down to, uh, you know, to 100 metres. That's quite a long way. Um, no air conditioning down there and they'd sink the, these shafts and they, then they'd dig um, tunnels from either side and take, take the coal from there, then wind it back up again. And it was really only when industrialisation began to get going, 17th century, it began to get a little bit more commercial. And then once we'd uh, opened up North Staffordshire to the world with the uh, Trent and Mersey Canal, etc., and turnpike roads, then uh, it really became uh, a major industry. We followed the, the, the coal seam down the valley and therefore we are a linear city. We haven't got a centre. We've made Hanley into our centre, um, but we haven't actually got a real centre unlike other cities. So the shape of the city and the who lives here and the whole nature of the city comes from this wonderful coal seam that runs down the valley um, and extracting that has determined the, uh, the shape of our city and the shape of our community. The best place to look at our coal field is to stand at Mow Cobb and just look south and southwest and you can virtually see and name the collieries. John Holland worked at Victoria Colliery in Biddulf. He now lives near Mow Cobb and he has a fantastic view across the North Staffordshire coal field. 
and you can follow the line all down the edge of the coal field. You've got the Victoria Colliery then behind that, as you can still see all the headgear and hopefully they'll keep it there as Whitfield. Then there's the Norton. Come round to the right, the Sneed. Follow further down, you've got Anley Deep, which is now Anley Forest Park. There's Wall Stanton, that's further round to the right. Further down from that, there's Berry Hill, which has become the headquarters. So you've got Mossfield, what they call the Old Sal, Park Hall, uh, the Glebe, Fenton, and then you've got Emmeth and uh, Florence. Very important coal field, very rich coal field, fast burning coal in areas, slow burning coal in other areas. It had this wonderful variety because it had the variety of seams laid down at different, through different eons. And that's why it's such an important coal field. Historically, it's been very important. Otherwise, the potteries probably wouldn't exist uh, because of the, the clay locally and the coal locally. Um, obviously led to the growth of the pottery industry. Wedgwood didn't think much of our clay, uh, which was pretty sort of second rate, really. Uh, but uh, this beautiful coal that fired at an even and a perfect temperature it was much better to bring the clay to the coal uh, than the coal to the clay. And so that's why uh, the great 18th century potters like Wood and Spode and, and Wedgwood um, developed an industry here. So it's everything to us. Because it needed the kilns firing, I mean, the two were in, interdependent. And it's not just pottery. You think about uh, the ironworks that began. Uh, the furnaces were, were fired by coal. And I think in the beginning, maybe um, you know, the, the iron masters were, were the major partner in the coal industry, but pottery certainly depended on it. Uh, salt works, we're not too far from salt works in Cheshire. Brick making, brewing, a whole range of industries were dependent on, on coal. You couldn't go two miles, three miles without coming across a pit. But well, the beauty about it was there was a lot of other industry allied to the pits, like Cowlisher Walkers at Biddleff used to employ 3,000 people, purely supplying and repairing mining machinery. And there were lots and lots of little businesses about that, that looked after the mining industry, uh, which created you know, thousands of jobs in the area. You either worked in the pots or in the mines. And it's, it's a funny thing that the mines and the pots never seemed to mix. They were pots, we were mines. And, and in the, never the twain shall meet type of thing. It's very strange, that is. It, yeah. I've thought about it many times since. I couldn't care less about potteries. <laughs> a miner's life was a hard one. Typically, a miner would work long hours in difficult conditions where the threat of injury or even death was a daily hazard. Conditions gradually got better through the 20th century and nationalisation in 1947 went a long way towards making the pit a safer place to work. But the job remained dirty, noisy and dangerous. Within these conditions, a special kind of relationship developed among workers. The comradeship down the mine, I've never, I've been in the army, but there's nothing like it. it it's, it's a phenomenon. And, and, and it doesn't matter who you talk to, ex is they look, tell, tell you the same. The camarade is absolutely brilliant and it's something I miss to this day. Uh, the first week I was here, they, they, play, they always play tricks on the apprentices and uh, they sent me down to the blacksmith shop to get uh, some holes for some washers and thick as I am, I went down there and asked the, 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 uh, the blacksmith. He laughed and I still didn't get it then and he sent me up with a, with a perforated sheet and told me to go see the, the, the mechanic who asked for it and ask him to cut him out himself because he hadn't got the time to cut the holes out. They were proud of mining and it seemed that the miners had got a camaraderie amongst themselves and that was good to see and they were still contrary people and they generally are all like that. They have their own culture, I think, miners, and uh, I was very pleased to be amongst that culture. Uh, I, oh, I have great fond memories of Golden Hill. I grew up there, and the people I always thought were terrific. We learned to live with one another. The camaraderie went on a pot bank, you know, they, they were all right, but it wasn't the same. I mean, when you're risking your neck down there, it's a totally different world. You've got to know what you're doing, or else you're in trouble. We've been built as a team and there's a lot of camaraderie amongst, amongst the men. They are a team, a unit. 
Um, I would only say that maybe you could only compare that sort of thing to maybe the armed forces or, or, or organisations like the fire brigade where there is that, you know, that, that, that team is built uh, around adversity. Um, and, and that strength carries through and, and I think that's quite unique for mine workers. Mine is a different than anybody else. We work in an environment that you're fighting against geological conditions most of the time. And uh, you look after each other. You've got to be friends. It's no good being an enemy. I mean, if anybody had a fallout, it was forgotten in 10 minutes. It seemed as if life revolved around pits and the pots. And, and I think everybody got, well, he got doing the pitch. You've got to get on with one another, with, with the environment, you know. Like. I've got a mate, Lewis and Amford, being, he's, he's 90 now. Now, he had his leg blown off in Tobruk, you know, and he says, we're heroes. He says, I'd sooner go back, he says, to Tobruk than good. He says, you want to get me good on pet lad? He says, you're the heroes, not me. He says, you had your leg blown off in Tobruk, you know, Ronald's. Yeah? He says, oh, no. So that's bravery going down there, you says. This pit produced a million tons two or three times. And uh, we used to have a flag. I think it was up on the Esketh pit. And when, on, the, uh, on the Friday, that's the day they flew the flag, if they reached the target. And when men came to work, especially the noon shift used to come to work, you get off the bus or out the car and look straight up the Esker, there's the flag flying. And if it was flying, hey, flag's flying, flag's flying today. And they're proud of what they do, they're proud they've, they've reached that target and it made everybody happy. The flag wasn't flying, we had a minute this week, like, you know. So that's how the men were, they were proud of the work, proud of the job and happy to come to work. My first day starting when I was a young lad, I'd first day off, I wouldn't go down, frightened to go down. <laughs> I want to go on the Monday, I want to go down. <laughs> and uh, they brought me the, what they call the charge hand at the bottom. And the banksman said, well, I'll go with Sam, he'll take you down, lad, you'll be all right. And uh, I went down with him, and that's how I got down, you know. And I worked in a pit bottom. 1953, I left school on the Friday, I started the pit on the Monday. Um, my father went mad. Um, he was a prison warden, but he was an army man, my father, and a prison warden, but he never wanted me to go in the mines, but I did. And I'm more than pleased that I did. I've enjoyed every minute of it. My father was down the pit, but uh, I mean, I, I'd got another career outside the pit, but he said, the pit's good enough for me, you little bastard, you stay, you're going down the pit. And unfortunately, in the 50s, that's what you did. You didn't uh, say no to your father. And I remember those words to this day. He said, <laughs> your mother has had 40 years of me going out to the door and not knowing when I was coming back and she's not going to start all over again with you. The school I went to was on the ridge that was uh, in between and if you look to the east you're due to go to the mining industry. If you look to the, to the west that was the pot industry. You've got a choice or the pots or coal mining. My father didn't want me to go into the mining industry and I, he got me a, a position with a building firm. But the, during one of the winters we had eight weeks of frost. Of course the builders those days did not carry on working when there was frost. They uh, stopped work and there were eight weeks of frost. And uh, when we come to start back the builder couldn't afford to keep me on. So that my father said, well right, the mine. I finished school in February 52. Cold February it was. Finished on the Friday at school at Woodhouse County Secondary Modern. And on the, when I got home that day, the first words what met me with, my dad, saying, the Uncle Joe has been saying Sammy Barker, he's the under manager at Mossfield Colliery. I think they can get the unfitting electric shop. <clears throat> She says, now I get the tardy sent up. Don't forget to wash behind the ears. It's only good wash. And go up and see him. Anyway, that was the start. I got the job. I was in the fitting shops. A young lad at my age, going down, and, well, I was on a deep bottom, about 3,000 foot deep. What's it been? It was four cages. And it went down slow, and you got in the cage, 
and there's supposed to be 14 men in. Well, up there, you bet me on, maybe about 17 or 18 men in the onset, that they called him. He used to be, I've had a boy shut the gate alone, and he used to put his foot in your back and push you in so he can get the men in so they can get down. And he was stuck like that, wasn't he? <laughs> Anybody built the way and got help you. <laughs> You can still find out about these sights, sounds and life underground at the Apedale Mining Museum in newcastle under Lyme. The museum is on the site of a former colliery and visitors can travel down a drift mine to find out for themselves what conditions were like. This is a drift mine. It is different to the, you know, the, the, the very large deep mines with the vertical shafts. Uh, this type of mining is, uh, is a little bit different, a little bit more basic than than what you might have seen at some of the other mining museums. The first part of the tour is obviously we take them into the lamp room and explain the situation of the equipment, the safety equipment, uh, the helmets, the, uh, the miners' tallies. And from there then we then enter the mine proper and uh, off we go. From the surface, from, from effectively daylight, they will be going about 600 feet into the mine. Now it is a drift mine, it's a horizontal shaft, not a vertical shaft, and it's a one in four. When we get down there, they will see the real coal face, they will see a lot of equipment, uh, they will see a shot firing display, and uh, uh, a cage, they will see, uh, you know, effectively the pit bottom area, and uh, how the mine has been constructed. This is the real experience, you are down there don't think that this, this is not real. Mining in North Staffordshire was, uh, was the major employer of, male, of, of males in North Staffordshire. Compared to the other industries, it was well paid, uh, but of course you then also got the dangers that came with that. And, you know, we have to preserve something of that, of that history. It's our history, it's the history of the people of North Staffordshire. That's why we need a mining museum and a mining heritage. Conditions underground were pretty grim. We're talking about hugely deep pits, the deepest pits in Western Europe in this area. Then you've got to get to the coal face. You don't come back up for a cup of tea at half past ten or your, your, your lunch. You know, everything goes down with you, your snap goes down with you. So you're eight hours, you're, you're working underground. When we were going down, you could feel the heat. But in the bowels of the earth, we started singing. <laughs> oh, it was deep and all. Quite often we were working in the deepest seams in Europe, uh, deepest seams underground in Europe. Uh, so consequently, as you go down the shaft, um, the, the temperature, the geological temperature increases as you go down. So unless you can get proper ventilation around some of the workings, it gets incredibly hot and dusty. And that's probably, uh, you know, the, the worst, those are probably the worst conditions you can work in. Hanley Deep Pit was a shock to everything that we'd ever seen in the pit. In the Durham coal field, they were very level and shallow. The seams were only three foot, two foot six, very, very thin seams. You come to North Staffordshire and they're on an incline and they're very high. And it's a completely new way of life and it took some getting used to at first. When they put me on a three foot six seam, it, you know, you say, how could you work on a three foot six seam? Well, it was uh, three in one. Every three yards went up one. And it was like that, you know, about that high. And uh, I was in the middle of the face, so you could tell. I had to scroll up on me tummy, throw me on me, me on me, you call it, seven pound on me. You know, about that, if you just cut the steel off and make it about that long. Oh, we had to chuck that up, chuck a snappy tin up, and then scroll up, up the face. Well, I'd get up in the morning, uh, five o'clock, put me pit clothes on. We didn't have any pit head bus then, didn't get until 1958. Put me uh, knee pads on my belt with my helmet and snapping tin, and off I'd go to the pit. And I can remember the uh, first week I was working on Coleon. It was a thin seam, uh, two foot nine inches thick, and uh, in that confined space, working with uh, a heavy, windy pick, you were using muscles that you'd never used before. And uh, I can remember saying to myself, John, what on earth are you doing down here?
The pit was a dangerous place to work, and over the years a number of safety measures were introduced to minimise the risk of injury or death. But coal mining remained a dangerous profession, and over the years North Staffordshire has lost many brave men and boys underground. The most frequent accidents were rock falls, but that tended to be one or two people affected. It happened a lot, but it's one or two people. Uh, look in the parish registers in North Staffs, it's, it, it's grim reading, because it, it's one or two sort of every week or so. Gas was a problem, um, choke damp that, um, your carbon dioxide, uh, people would pass out, it's odourless, you can't see it, it's a danger. And then what they called fire damp in the old days, gases like methane, flammable gases. Um, incredibly dangerous. You think you're underground with flammable gases and you've got coal dust in the atmosphere. It's volatile. Um, and flooding. You never knew if there's an underground lake, you know, you'd chop through the face and a million gallons of water were waiting for you. But it was the explosions that hit the headlines. Well, the mini pit was the biggest disaster in this area, where 155 men killed. And it started off with the Emetian uh, gas explosion. And uh, it was made worse, of course, with the excessive coal dust.